Welcome to Prime 9, the countdown show that covers the very best in baseball. Guaranteed to start arguments, not end them. This week, it's the nine greatest World Series of all time. Why nine? That's baseball. Nine players, nine innings, Prime 9. What makes a great World Series? Dramatic moments? The nail-biting tension of extra innings. The Yankees rise from the absolute dead. We go to extra innings tied at two. An unsung hero who has a coming out party. He won it! Percentage won it with a home run! Or a superstar who puts a stamp on his legacy. Well, in truth, the great World Series has to have a bit of everything. They're called Fall Classics for a reason. So here are the greatest World Series of all time, starting with number nine on Prime Nine. In 1955, the Brooklyn Dodgers were in the World Series, but they'd have to face their arch rival New York Yankees, a team that was 5-0 and against them in the Fall Classic. And here come the Yankees for the start of game number one. From the start, the Dodgers were determined to change the course of history and seize the momentum of the series as Jackie Robinson stole home. Or did he? An umpire Summers calls him safe on the daring maneuver. He was out. They called him safe. And Yogi went straight up in the air 15 feet and he wanted to kill the umpire. The Dodgers got the call at home, but the Yankees, who were home, Back in Brooklyn, the Dodgers completed a baseball first and swept all three games. For the first time in World Series history, a team has come roaring back to win three straight after losing the first two games. But the Yankees forced a seventh game, and 23-year-old Johnny Padres took the mound for Brooklyn. With a 2 to nothing lead in the sixth, Padres got some help after the tie. hit the fly ball down the left field line. There goes the drive down the left field line, and Sandy Amaris races for the ball. If you were a right-handed thrower, you couldn't have caught the ball with the left hand. But because the glove was on his right hand and the speed that Amaros had, he went over and caught the ball. Sticks out his glove just in time. And makes the catch. Sandy's legendary catch was a sign for Brooklyn fans that their long wait was over. No ifs, ands, or buts. To win and finally beat the Yankees for the first time, kind of got the monkey off all the veteran players on the Brooklyn Dodgers. And I think they could finally relax and say that we beat the Yankees. The Dodgers had indeed done it. The pots on the fire escape, car horns, church bells ringing. It was like the liberation of Paris, VJ Day, and New Year's Eve all rolled into one. The 1912 World Series showcased the Boston Red Sox and New York Giants and featured a classic matchup between the team's respective aces on the hill. Here was Christy Matthewson in 1912, actually passed his prime. And here was Joe Wood, this youngster, 34 and 5, opposing him. A series memorable for so many reasons even included a game two, 6-6 six, six tie. Remarkably, there was a... The deciding game went into extra innings, where New York took a 2-1 to -one lead in the 10th, but not for long. A routine fly ball to center fielder Fred Snodgrass was muffed, permitting the Boston Red Sox hitter to land on second base. The costly error led to a winning rally by Boston. Fred's fault. 
The series was always remembered as Snodgrass Muff, and Fred Snodgrass was to go to his grave with that emblazoned across his forehead. Welcome back to Prime 9, featuring the greatest World Series of all time. You've seen the ninth and eighth best. We now continue with number seven. Pittsburgh was roaring in 1960, for the Pirates were in the Fall Classic for the first time in 33 years. There they were already so successful, and of course they were predicted to beat us uh, four straight. The Pirates won the opener, but the Yankees captured the next two by outscoring Pittsburgh 26 to three. Despite the pounding, the Bucks continued to battle. The Yankees seemed to outclass them by so much and to dominate them. And the Yankees win it 10 to nothing. Yet the Pirates kept staying in the The World Series is all square again at 2 and 2. Although the Yankees would outscore the Pirates 46 to 17 through the first 6 games, the series went to full 7. And with the score tied at 9 in the bottom of the ninth, an unlikely hero fashioned a fantastic finish. Bill Mazeroski will lead off in the last of the ninth. All I'm thinking about walking up to the plate was, I gotta hit the ball hard somewhere. I gotta get something started. Anyone who was there will never forget that sight with that ball clearing. The only thing going through my mind is we beat them, we beat them, we beat the great Yankees, we beat them. Pittsburgh begins in celebration of victory in one of the most titanic struggles in baseball history. A lot of Red Sox fans, I think, are pinching themselves right now. They can't believe tonight is finally here. The chance to win their first World Series title in almost 70 years was at hand, but they'd be facing a confident Mets squad that had won a season's best 108 games. And for the New York Mets, they felt they'd be in the World Series since the first day of spring. That they were determined to end the misery of their fans. Nobody had, had, had actually come into our place and beat us like they did the first two ball games. And the Red Sox, a three to one underdog team, have swept two in New York. Coming back to Fenway, we had a lot of confidence going. We did, and, and we felt good about ourselves. But that confidence took a hit when the Mets won two of their own in Boston. We went down there and played well, and we allowed ourselves to, you know, put ourselves in a position to get back in it. The Mets left Boston down three games to two, but were determined to land on their feet back at Shea and staged a late rally in game six. It's a brand new ball game. Three, three tie in the bottom of the eighth. All that changed in the 10th when Dave Henderson came up big for Boston as he had throughout the playoffs. So quiet in New York, you can almost hear Boston. Hear Boston, hear Boston, hear Boston. Leading five to three with two out in the bottom of the tenth, the Red Sox could taste it. But baseball is a funny game. A base hit. Lined into left field, base hit for Carter. The Mets are still alive. Two strikes on the next hitter. Another base hit. Third ball, and that's going to be hit to center. Base hit. Still not one. We're two runs up. Right drive, it'll be a base hit in the center field. Shut the door. Bob Stanley then faced Mookie Wilson, and his pitch eluded catcher Rich Gettman. For the third time tonight, the Mets have come from behind. The Red Sox were so close, and now it was tied. The winning run is at second base. Three and two to Mookie Wilson. Little roller up along first. Behind the back, it gets through Buckner. Here comes Knight, and the Mets win it. 
It was a crushing defeat, though Boston would rebound to take a 3-0 Game 7 lead. But after their miraculous comeback, there was no stopping. Dream has come through. Obviously, we finished. And now the crowd salutes them as they can say, truly, we are number one. Welcome back to Prime 9. Featuring the greatest World Series of all time, the Dodgers' first title checks in at number nine, followed by the 1912 Classic. Then there's the Amazing Maz and the second coming of the Amazing Mets, which means it's time for number five. And the 97-year-old Cleveland Indians. But the contrasts in this series went far beyond that. This was a series of extremes. The Florida Marlins had virtually no history. On the other hand, you have the Indians. They haven't won a World Series since 1948. And then you had the difference in the weather condition. You know, South Florida, 80 degrees for some of these games. And for games three, Once you broke it down to baseball, something else set this series apart. For this was a classic case of pitching versus power. Indians during that period of time, they had monsters, mashers, Dave Justice, Sandy Alomar. Manny Ramirez hit seventh some of the time for us. And one swing of the bat from Jim Bob Tomey and it's all over. And we knew, you know, it was a matter of whether our pitching staff was able to hold up enough against these boppers. First to face the test was the NLCS MVP, rookie sensation, Levon Hernandez. What a nice story it was having LeVon Hernandez, who recently defected from Cuba. Twice in the series, which remained up for grabs right until the end. We won game one, they won game two, we won game three, back and forth until game seven. And that too was tied after nine full innings. Baseball fans couldn't have asked for more. It was tense on both sides because, you know, it doesn't get any more compelling in our sport than a game. We have the X factor caveat that this is extra innings, so every pitch mattered. On to the 11th, where with Craig Council on third and two out, the Marlins had the right man at the plate. Edgar Renteria, the entire year, had been one of our best clutch hitters. He had come to the plate so many times in situations just like that and found a way to get the job done. A liner off Nagy's glove in the center. And the Florida Marlins, who to this day have never finished first in any season, have the first of their two world championships. And the Cleveland Indians are still waiting. When the Washington Senators won the pennant in 1924, it marked the first time in their 23-year history that they had done so. But now in the World Series, they would have to face one of the best teams of all time. This New York Giants team of 1924 had just won its fourth National League pennant in a row. It had a virtual entire line. its own in their aging and beloved pitcher, Walter Johnson. And this was the big train's first date with the big dance. Walter Johnson was by then acknowledged as the greatest pitcher of all time, pitching year after year for losing teams, setting fantastic totals. He won over 400 games. He pitched over 100 shutouts. He was it, but he was now at the end of his career. Of course, America loves both underdogs and heroes, so Johnson and the Senators were the popular choice among fans. The only problem was Walter lost his first two starts to the rampaging Giants. Which was a tragic thing. Yet in spite of Johnson's two losses, Washington forced a decisive seventh game. The Senators were led by boy wonder manager, 27-year-old second baseman Bucky Harris, whose most successful managing during the series was with his bat. 
He hits a hard grounder down third base that hits a pebble and bounces over Freddie Lindstrom's head for a double that scores the tying run. Top of the ninth, Giants come to bat against a relief pitcher, Walter Johnson. Johnson pitches beautifully, gets in and out of jam. Well, and then in the 12th inning, the same thing happens. Another drive down to third base, it's by legend the same pebble <laughs> and goes for the game. City went crazy. It was the first time Washington had won a world's championship. The line that got circulated so much was, God just couldn't stand to see the big train lose another one. In my view, the 2001 World Series was Won the first two games, and then the Yankees go into Yankee Stadium. Both teams and our country in the shadows of 9-1-1. As we gathered in Yankee Stadium for Game Three, people weren't sure if we were in the safest place in the world or the most dangerous place in the world. It was a very unnerving feeling. You know, the moment when our president threw out the first pitch. He took so much time to do it. I was so nervous. I was like, pitching in their game three victory. And as game four commenced, you could sense the tide was turning. Full moon. You know what that means? Crazy things happen in the full moon. The score remained tied as we bid goodbye to October Swung on a drill to right field. Going back to And a jump at the wall. Deja! 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 A home run by Derek Jeter. It was high drama in the Bronx, only to be repeated in Game 5. But once again, the Yankees trailed by two. I don't know what it is, but there's something in Yankee Stadium. You know, the ghosts of the Babe and Lou and Mick are there. They should have won those games. It was good for that city, and it was good for the game, and it was good for the World Series. We didn't like it much, but that's the way it should have been. But now the Diamondbacks were back in Phoenix. To the tune of 15 to 2. But the Yankees regained control in game seven and held a two to one lead in the ninth. Of course, everybody knew that the dominant closer in Major League Baseball for so many years, Mariano Rivera, was coming in. Last chance for the Diamondbacks, down two to one. But not even the best closers are perfect. The bases are loaded. They're loaded for Gonzalez. You know, this is a situation. on the nine greatest World Series in the history of baseball. These are all seven game series, showdowns that took the tension of the fall classic to still another level. So now it's time for the greatest World Series of all, the two best October's baseball fans have ever seen. We begin with number two. This was baseball at its best. Two fresh teams that you have not seen before. The Braves coming from last place. The Twins coming from last place. Game with passion. The home team won the first five games. And that put Atlanta up three games to two. 
But when the series moved back to Minnesota, Kirby Puckett achieved folk hero status. He corks it to left center and chased by Puckett. He caught it! Caught it! Kirby Puckett with the catch. It will forever be embedded in our mind. It was gone. The ball was gone, and somehow it stayed in, and somehow he... Tied at three in the 11th, Kirby finished the job. I remember coming up that end, and I was leading off, and I told Chili Davis, I said, I'm going to get on bunt here. Charlie's a good pitcher. I said, but I can bunt on him. And Chili said, bunt. He said, bunt my You know what? He said, get up there, get a good change up, hang, change up, and hit it out. Let's go home. In the deep left center from Mitchell, and we'll see you tomorrow night. Get it. But Kirby only dominated the news for 24 hours for game seven. Morris won 162 games in the 80s, more than anyone. But in 1991, he was 36. I watched the Tigers as a kid, and Jack Morris was one of my favorite guys to watch pitch. John Smoltz was only 24, and so this generational face-off got underway. Down in order, go the Braves. And Smoltz is off on the right foot with a strikeout. You're watching it and you have an appreciation as to how well each pitcher is pitching, but in the back of your mind, you're hoping that when Jack goes out to the mound, it's a game. Even when the Braves threatened in the eighth, the Wiley Morris managed beautifully. When TK came out, he smiled, and I just stood there like, I'm going to kill you if you take me out. I said to him, Jack, I said, you've done more than enough. He said, I'm all right. I said, oh, hell, it's just a game. Go ahead, Vic. And the play is to Hall. Out there. Out there. Incredible. It just went on and on and on. Atlanta has it scored in 10 innings against Jack Morris. Smoltz had been lifted in the eighth. And two innings later, with the man on third, it was over. I said it a couple times, this is a great game, guys. This is a beautiful game. And it was. It was just a classic. The 1975 Cincinnati Reds, a team chock full of all-stars, were in search of their first World Series title. Nineteen eighteen. Together they gave us the greatest World Series ever. Every game had something that was exceptional. Great plays on defense, great plays offensively, tremendous players, Hall of Famers all over the place. Um, and it's just great action from start to finish. Fans throughout the nation were hanging on every pitch when the series returned to Boston with the Reds up three. flavor because when we went to Boston we had three or four days rained out when you have a World Series there's a thousand reporters at the event and they had nothing to do but write stories about Dewey Evans and Yaskrimski and Bench and Morgan and Perez everyone in the country realized what we were doing and who it was that was doing it because of all the press and when the skies cleared and game six got underway it defied belief Yeah, first and second, nobody out. Let's go to work. Down by three in the late inning magic. He made the worst swing in the history of mankind. Just the perfect swing, and this one is gone. The game is tied at six and six. When Cincinnati threatened again in the top of the 11th, Boston outfielder Dwight Evans took matters into his own hands. Should we say glove? Ken Griffey Sr. can run. And he's on first base, and I'm in right field. You got Joe Morgan at the plate. So as soon as he hits the ball, it goes directly over my head. And I actually caught the ball this way. And I lost the ball from here to here, and it landed in my glove. And to this day, I don't know how it landed in my glove, but I thank God it did. Oh, what a catch he made! I swear the ball caught him. And he turned that into a double. 
of the greatest game-winning hits in World Series history. Freddie and I were standing on the on-deck circle, and I said, Freddie, I don't know, but I feel something good here. I'm gonna hit one off the wall, drive me in. Well, he forgot about the part of me knocking him in. There it goes, a long drive. If it stays fair, home run. It's one of those images that is etched in everybody's mind. I guarantee you, everybody who saw it can remember where they were, what time it was, who they were with. And Carl Fisk had a lot of little boy in him right there. Probably one of the most exciting ball games that I've ever played in. Game six was so dramatic, some folks forget that Cincinnati won game seven the next day. And Cincinnati has won the world championship, beating the Boston Red Sox four to three. You know what I tell everybody? That we, the Red Sox, won that World Series three games to four. Well, with all these seven game series, it looks like we've run into extra innings. That's our prime nine. What's yours?